If you're anything like me, then you want the process of editing your YouTube videos to be as quick and as painless as possible. Which is why in this video, I'm going to be going over 12 simple tips that I use to edit my YouTube videos in Premiere Pro. Tips that will allow you to cut, edit, paste, and color correct your videos, as well as clean up all of your audio, all in the shortest amount of time possible. So if you're someone who doesn't like to spend hours editing video, then stick around. Hey guys, Craig here. Hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so this video is going to go over 12 simple tips that I use to edit my YouTube videos in Premiere Pro. That being said, just know that the majority of these tips can pretty much be used in any video editing software. The names of the tools that I'll be using in Premiere Pro may differ slightly from the program that you're using, but the functionality of those tools is likely to be fairly similar. And just know that I'm not using extremely expensive cameras or audio recording equipment to shoot my videos. I'm just using low budget equipment, the kind that most of you will probably be starting off with. So the tips in this video are not only designed to help you be more efficient while editing your video, but they're also designed to help you get the most out of what little you have to work with. So if you're ready to get started, let's get to it. Just let your camera roll while you're shooting. This first tip is something that you should be doing outside of your editing software, and that is just letting your camera roll. When you're editing your YouTube videos, you're going to need to color adjust every piece of footage that you bring into your editor, as well as sync and clean up every audio clip that you bring in as well. And those processes take time. So the last thing that you want to be doing is bringing a hundred different clips of raw video and audio into your editor before you even get started. So for that reason, it's much better to just let your video camera roll while you're shooting your videos. And this also holds true for your external audio recorder as well, if you're using one. If you're filming your monologue and you need to stop to go over something in your script, just let the camera roll. If when shooting your video you're continually being interrupted by loud cars passing outside of your window, stop and restart the take if you need to, but just let the camera roll. If you're like me and you separate your video scripts into A-roll and B-roll dialogue, when you're looking down away from the camera and just reading directly off the script, let the camera roll. Those video clips of you looking down will actually be quite useful to you in the video editor. They'll give you a clear indication of where you need to be inserting B-roll footage into your video. But the main reason you want to let your video camera roll is because the fewer clips that you have to color correct, sound adjust, and sync inside of the editor, the faster your editing process is going to go. So bringing just four long video clips into your editor is going to be far better than bringing 60 short video clips in. This tip alone will save you a lot of time when editing your videos. Okay, let's move on to tip number two. Always create a brand new project folder. Creating a YouTube video for the most part requires quite a few media assets. From the raw video footage and audio coming from your camera or recording device to the B-roll clips of stock footage and screen capture videos. And unlike software programs like Photoshop, where the assets that you bring into a particular project file actually become part of that file, due to the sheer file size of many video clips, Premiere Pro just isn't able to do that. So it needs to keep track of the files from wherever they're being stored on your computer. And if you happen to move one of them midway through your project, unless you can locate that file, it'll be removed from your project timeline, and this can be a total pain in the ass. And this is why it's so important to always create a project folder at the beginning of each new video project. Now personally, I keep a template folder that's set up just the way I like it saved on my desktop. That way all I have to do is make a copy of it and then rename it to whatever my project's called. And that folder is set up like this. I usually just name the folder an abbreviated version of whatever my YouTube video is going to be titled. Inside of this folder there are three more folders. The first is named Working Files. This is where I store my Premiere project files as well as all of the backups that Premiere saves throughout the project. And I'll show you how to set this folder up for that purpose in just a bit. The second folder is titled Raw Video and Audio. This is where I store my raw camera footage as well as all of the raw audio from my external recorder. Now if you're using audio from your camera in your videos, then you'll only have these video clips here in this folder. But if you're using an external audio recorder like a Zoom recorder, then I highly recommend that you keep all of these files together in the same folder. These audio files are going to have to be synced up to these video files, so you're going to want to keep them in the same order. 
And it's just a hell of a lot easier to do that when they're all in the same place. Okay, and the last folder in my video project folder is my B-roll folder. This folder actually has two additional folders inside of it. The first is titled stock footage and the second is titled screen captures. Stock footage are simply the video clips that you're downloading from free sites like Pexels or from paid sites like iStock. This is the footage that you'll be placing in the spots where you're not talking to the camera in your raw footage. And as for the second folder, screen captures are just video clips that you've recorded of your monitor using some type of screen capture software. This can consist of footage of you digitally drawing or just clips of websites that you may be talking about in your videos. I'll go over how and when to use both of these types of footage a little bit later on in the video. And if you need a good screen capture software, one that's available at a reasonable price is Flashback. And if you use my promo code at checkout, you'll save 10% off your purchase price. I'll have a link to it in the description section of this video. Now when it comes time to start a new project in Premiere Pro, the first thing you're going to have to do is choose a folder to save your project in. So find the project folder that you just created and choose the working files folder as the folder to save your Premiere files in. And then just hit the create button. All of your Premiere files will now be saved in your project folder. But as far as your project folder goes, that's all you need for now. Okay, let's go on to tip number three. Use your raw camera footage to fill in your sequence settings. So when you're starting a new project in Premiere Pro, one of the first things that you're gonna to have to do is set up your project sequence settings. These settings include everything from your frame rate and frame size to your audio sample rate. Now for most of us who are creating YouTube videos, we're probably just bringing in raw footage straight from our cameras. So the easiest way to set these settings up is just to drag a clip of your raw camera footage onto your timeline. Premiere will read all of the settings from that clip and then match them in your video sequence settings. And they're all of the settings that you're probably going to want for your video anyway. 29.97 frames per second frame rate, 1920 by 1080 frame size, as well as a 48,000 hertz sample rate for your audio. Now the reason that I said drag a clip of your raw HD footage from your camera onto your timeline is because let's say you had one clip that you wanted to use in your video that was only 720p standard definition footage, but you had to use it because you couldn't find a higher quality clip of it. If you were to drag that clip onto your timeline first, then all of your sequence settings would be set to that lower quality footage and any subsequent HD footage that you drag onto your timeline will have to be reduced down to that lower quality. Even though 99% of the rest of your footage is 1080p HD footage, your video would still be rendered out in that 720p standard definition, unless you went back into your sequence settings and changed everything back to HD. So to make sure that your rendered video has the same high quality as your camera footage does, make sure to drag one of those raw camera footage clips onto your timeline first. On a side note, if you're someone who's using 4K footage and you're looking to get more of a cinematic look to your video, then you're obviously going to have to make some changes to your sequence settings to get that look. But for most of us, the settings that come with our raw HD camera footage will do just fine. After you've placed your first clip onto your timeline, it's a good idea to save out your project file so that you have a copy of it in your project folder. You can name it whatever you want. Okay, on to tip number four. Use the effects workspace to edit your video in Premiere Pro. The first time that you log into Premiere Pro, you're gonna have a few options as to how your workspace is gonna be set up. If you go up to the window tab in the top menu and click on it, and then from the drop down menu, hover your cursor over workspaces, you can see that you have quite a few options to choose from. And each option is set up for its own particular purpose. But from my experience, the best option for beginners is the effects workspace. This setup has everything you'll need to edit your videos. Okay, so going over the layout from right to left, in the far right panel, you have all of your video and audio effects. These are gonna be very important to you as you color adjust your video and clean up your audio throughout your project. Moving to the top left, you have your main video screen. What you're seeing and hearing on this screen are the clips that you have placed on your timeline below it. Now for the most part, you're probably just gonna to wanna to leave your view set to fit. But there will be times when you need to zoom in closer on your video, so just know that you have the option to zoom in as close as you need to. Okay, moving on. Next, below your main video screen, you have your timeline. This is gonna be where you do all of your cutting and editing of your video clips. 
By default, you'll have a few video tracks as well as a few audio tracks below that. Just know that if you ever need to add or delete a track or two, all you have to do is right click on one of the tracks and choose either add or delete tracks. And this holds true for the audio tracks as well. Okay, to the right of your timeline, you have your audio meter. This will be an extremely important tool when you're cleaning up your audio. This is where you'll be able to tell if your audio volume is too low or too high. And I'll get into that a little bit later on in the video. Now to the right of your timeline, you have your toolbar. I'll go over how to use some of these tools a little later on in the video as well. Now the panel to the left of your toolbar is where the project files are located. Any video or audio clips that you import into Premiere will be right here. As I showed you earlier, whenever you want to use one, you simply have to drag it onto your timeline. Okay, and the final panel in the top left hand corner actually has a few functions, but I'm only going to focus on two for now. The first is your effects menu. It's from here that you have complete control of your clips. You can control everything from position, scale, and rotation to any number of effects that you may want to apply to your clip from the effects panel. And I'll go over some of these effects in just a bit. And just know that every clip has its own effects menu. So if you want to be able to manipulate a particular clip, all you have to do is select it on your timeline. Now this top panel also doubles as your preview monitor for your project files. So let's say you import a particular clip that you just want to use a piece of. All you have to do is double click on that file in your project folder and it'll be loaded into your preview window. Now just like your timeline, you can just scrub through the clip to find the section that you want to use. Once you find the start of the section that you're looking for, just click on the mark in icon in the viewer toolbar. Then scrub to where you want your clip to end and then just click on the mark out icon. This is now sectioned off just the clip of video that you want to use. So from here you have three options. You can use your left mouse button to grab the video right from the viewer and just drag it down to the timeline. And as you can see you get both the video and the audio when you do that. Now if you only want the video from the clip, just use your left mouse button to grab this video icon and drag it to your timeline. In this situation, you're only getting the video. And if you grab the audio icon, you'll only be getting the audio from this clip. Now if there are other clips that you want to use from this video, then just click on both the clear in and clear out icons to get rid of your marks. And then just repeat what you just did, but with a different section of the video. Now if you're not seeing all of these icons in your toolbar, just click on this little plus icon at the far right hand side of your toolbar. And then from the pop-up menu, choose Reset Layout. Now all you have to do is just drag and drop the icons that you want onto your toolbar. So how I would normally set up my toolbar is I would leave all of these center icons where they are. These are your play, step back, and step forward buttons. Next, I'd remove the icons that I don't need. The icons that you definitely want in your toolbar are the mark in and mark out, as well as the play in and play video out icon. And then on the other side, I want the clear in and clear out, as well as the go to next marker and go to previous marker icons. This is pretty much everything you'll need. Now just click on the OK button and your preview toolbar will be all set up. This effects workspace has everything you need to edit your YouTube videos. And that's why I strongly recommend that you use this workspace over all of the other options when just getting started. Okay, let's move on to tip number five. Sync your external audio to your video clip before you start to cut. This is why in tip one, I recommended that you just let your camera roll. The last thing you want to have to do is sync up external audio to 50 different video clips. That would be way too time consuming. So if you're like me and you use an external audio recorder to record your audio, then you're going to have to sync that audio to your video before you begin to edit your video clips. That being said, if you're just going to use the audio from your camera that comes attached to your raw video clips, then you can just skip this step and move on to tip number six. But for those of you who are going to be using external audio, here's how you sync it. So after you've placed your raw camera video clip onto your timeline, drag the external audio clip that was recorded at the same time as your video was onto your timeline as well. You can just place it on the audio track below the camera's audio track. Now using your selection tool, group select all of the clips, both audio and video, on your timeline. With the clips selected, right click on them and choose synchronize from the pop-up menu. From the synchronize point menu, make sure you choose audio. 
Then just hit the OK button. Premiere will now synchronize both your camera and external audio clips. And if I play a portion of the clip once it's done, you can hear that even with both audio clips turned on, there's almost no delay whatsoever. As well as clean up all of your audio, all in the shortest amount of time possible. Now all you have to do is deselect all of the clips, and then holding down your Alt key on your keyboard, select the audio clip from your camera. Make sure that you're holding down your Alt key when you're doing this, or you'll select your video clip as well. Then, with your camera audio clip selected, just hit your Delete key. If you're anything like me, then you want the process of editing your YouTube videos to be as quick and as painless as possible. Your external audio clip is now synced to your video clip, and you can now start editing it. Okay, let's move on to tip number six. Pace your videos while you're cutting them. Okay, so now that your audio is synced, it's time to start cutting away all of the bad footage that you don't want in your video. So to do that, you're gonna use this tool right here, and this is your razor tool. To use this, all you have to do is line your slider up to the point in your video where you wanna cut it, and then using your razor tool, line the little dotted line up with your slider, and then left click with your mouse on the video clip. As you can see, this video clip has now been cut. And if I were using the camera audio that came in with this video clip, your audio clip would be cut at the same time. But because I'm using external audio, I have to cut them separately. And because I want my audio clip to be cut in the exact same spot, I'm just going to line the razor's dotted line up with the previous cut in my video, and then simply move the razor down onto my audio clip, and then left click one more time. Both my video and my audio clips are now cut in the exact same spot. Now all I have to do is go over to my toolbar and grab my selection tool, that's the arrow icon, and then just drag select both the video and the audio clips that are in front of my cut at the same time, and then just hit my delete key on my keyboard. Now as you can see, I have a huge gap between the beginning of my timeline and where I cut my footage. To remove that gap, I simply need to place my cursor on the track in front of either the video or the audio clip, right click and choose ripple delete. That will move all of the video and audio footage that's lying to the right of the gap over to the left to close the gap. And just know that if you have multiple clips on your timeline, the ripple delete will move all of those clips over at the same time. Now before you move on to your next cut, it's always a good idea to place a cut in both your video and your audio clips just a few frames after the audio of your good clip ends. Okay, so now that you've got your first usable clip, it's time to start removing all of the unwanted media from the rest of your footage. Now when you're shooting your video, you're probably going to be doing take after take until you get one that you feel is good enough to use. And that good take is more than likely going to be the final take. So rather than sitting at your computer and listening to all of your bad takes, just listen to your first take so that you can hear what you're saying, and then just move your slider to your last take. Which is why in this video, I'm going to be going over 12 tips that will allow you to cut. If you get to a spot where you're saying something different, then you know you've gone too far. Which is why in this video, I'm going to be going over so once you've found your last take, just place your slider a few frames before your audio starts or before where you start making any facial expressions. Don't worry if it's not exact, we're going to fine tune this in just a second. Now just grab your razor tool and cut both the video and the audio clip. Then using your selection tool, group select the clips directly in front of where you just cut and then hit your delete key. And then once again, place your selection tool directly in front of your video clip, right click and choose ripple delete. And as you can see, your second clip is now directly behind your first clip. Okay, and this is where tip number six comes into play. One of the most important things that you can do while editing your YouTube videos is to make sure that you're pacing them correctly. And pacing is just how well your video flows from clip to clip. When you're speaking with someone, you tend to leave a slight pause after every statement you make, just to give the person you're speaking with some time to interject on how they feel about what you just said. But when you're shooting a YouTube video, you're not talking with someone, you're talking at someone. So that long pause isn't necessary. In fact, in video, that pause can be actually quite uncomfortable to watch. So the pause you leave after each clip shouldn't be any longer or shorter than the time required to take a breath during a normal conversation. Let me give you an example. So editing your YouTube videos to be as quick and as painless as possible. Which is why in this video, I'm going to be going over 
Okay, so in this case, that pause is way too long. This would be considered bad pacing of a video. Now on the flip side, if I was to shorten that pause too much, then it would sound something like this. YouTube videos to be as quick and as painless as possible, which is why in this video, I'm gonna be going over 12. So that is paced too fast. If I was actually speaking to someone, I wouldn't even have enough time to take a breath there. So what you wanna do is put just enough space at the end of the last clip and just enough space at the beginning of the next clip so that it equals out to the amount of time required to take a breath. So like this videos to be as quick and as painless as possible, which is why in this video I'm going to be going over 12 simple tips. That subtle pause between the two clips is just enough time for me to take a breath in between sentences. So now what you need to do is go through and cut out all of the footage that you don't want. But before we move on, I want to show you one more thing. So I'm going to put a cut at the end of this second clip and then I'm going to quickly go and find my third clip and set it up as well. Now, I just want to quickly talk about transitions here. And a transition is basically how one clip moves on to the next one. So what you're watching right here is a basic jump cut. Now, jump cuts are fine if you're jumping to a completely different piece of footage. But when the footage you're jumping to is the exact same clip only a few seconds later, it can sometimes look a little bit odd, almost like a skipping record. Just know that there are a lot of transition effects inside of Premiere that you can just drag and drop between your clips, but I don't recommend using a lot of them, simply because most of them are kind of dated. Unless of course you're trying to achieve a certain look. That being said, there are plenty of studies that have been done that suggest that there should be a dramatic change to what's being viewed on screen at least every 6 to 8 seconds throughout your video. That change is to keep your viewer engaged and to keep them from getting bored. Now one of the things you can do to rectify this is to replace the footage of you on screen with alternate b-roll footage. And I'll touch on that in just a bit. But let's say that you want to stick to the footage of you on screen. This current jump cut isn't enough of a difference to make it look like the video has changed. So one trick you can use when trying to make a visual change in your video but you're using the clips from the exact same piece of footage is to increase the scale of the video on every other clip. Right now, all of these clips have a scale of 100%, and as you can see, the change between each clip just looks like a minor flicker. But if I change the scale of the middle clip to 108%, watch the difference it makes. That subtle zoom almost gives the illusion that the footage is being shot by a separate camera. Now just a warning, if your footage is only 720p, don't use this zoom trick. It'll make your already subpar footage look even worse. If your footage is 1080p HD, don't zoom in more than 110%. Anything more than that will start to look pixelated. Now if you're using 4K footage, you'll have a lot more room to play with, so you can zoom in even further. And on a side note, while you're deleting all of the footage that you don't want, be sure to remove any little annoying sounds like clicks that come out of your mouth from your good footage as well. Just know that you can cut your audio track without having to cut your video track as well, like this. It'll just make your video's audio track sound a lot better. Okay, let's move on to tip number seven. Color correct your camera footage before bringing in your B-roll. When it comes time to color correct your raw camera footage, I strongly suggest that you do it before bringing in your B-roll. And the reason for this is, is because if you're shooting all of your on-camera footage in the same location and at the same time, then chances are all of your clips are going to need the exact same color correction. So what you're going to do is color correct your first clip, and then when you're done, copy that color correction effect and group paste it onto all of your other clips. And this is going to be a lot easier to do if you don't have a bunch of B-roll footage mixed in with it. Not only that, but much of the B-roll footage that you're going to be using, especially if you're using stock footage from sites like Pexels or iStock, will have already been professionally color corrected. I mean, you may have to do some slight adjustments to a few clips just so that they match your current color and lighting profile, but even then, that's going to be on a clip-by-clip -clip basis. So getting your raw camera footage out of the way first is going to save you some extra time. Now inside of Premiere Pro, the best tool to color correct your video with is the Lumetri Color Effect. And you can find that in your effects panel under Video Effects and Color Correction. All you have to do is just drag the effect onto the clip that you want to color adjust. Now if you're using a really high-end camera, you may not have to do any of this stuff. But because I'm using a lower budget camera, I unfortunately have to do some color correction. 
but as you can see, even with crappy footage, the Lumetri color effect can make quite a bit of difference. Now there are plenty of professional editors on YouTube who can show you how to color correct your videos far better than I ever could. So I'm going to leave the color correction tutorials to them. That being said, once you've got your footage looking the way you want, just right click on the clip in your timeline and choose copy from the pop-up menu. Then group select the rest of your camera footage and then right click on one of the clips and then from the pop-up menu choose paste attributes. It's extremely important that you only paste the effects attributes. If you use that zoom technique from the previous tip, then that scale setting of 108% will appear in this menu as motion. So if the clip you copied the color effect from had a scale increase, then be sure to uncheck that before you paste it on all of your other clips. Otherwise, they'll all scale up to 108%. Okay, let's move on to tip number eight. Use B-roll footage to help make your audio's narrative point. When you're writing your video scripts, it's always a good idea to separate all of your narration into two categories. The first is A-roll, which is the footage where you're going to be talking to the camera. And the second category is B-roll, and that's simply alternate footage that's going to be playing over top of your voice narration. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, this type of footage can consist of stock footage, screen captures, as well as additional footage that you shot yourself that doesn't contain you talking in the video. If you're not exactly sure how to separate this dialogue up when you're writing your video script, then be sure to watch my video on how to write a YouTube video script. I'll put a link to it at the end of this video. Now I see a lot of YouTube content creators who when making tutorial videos just remain on camera throughout the entire video. The problem with that is, if you're discussing a topic that's somewhat complex, it can be difficult for your viewers to understand what it is you're talking about without a visual reference, and that's where B-roll comes in. The whole point of B-roll is just to make the point that you're trying to get across to your viewers just a little bit clearer. And this doesn't only apply to tutorial videos, this holds true for any type of video. Long drawn out monologues can become very boring to watch if there isn't some kind of break in the footage, and that's why most professional editors recommend that you make some kind of change to what's showing on the screen at least every 6 to 8 seconds throughout your video. Those changes from clip to clip help to keep your viewers engaged. That being said, don't just add in some random b-roll footage just to break up your monologue. Add in b-roll footage to help you clarify the point that you're trying to make. Let me give you a few examples. So if your narration is discussing what it's like to be an artist, then put in some b-roll footage of an artist creating art. If you're talking about making money, then add in a clip of somebody handling money. If your topic of discussion is about overcoming stress, then find footage of somebody who looks like they're stressed out. If you're trying to tell your viewers how to stay lean while eating 3,000 calories every day, it's probably not wise to show some b-roll of your dog. Unless, of course, what you're trying to tell them is that if they want to stay lean while eating that many calories, they need to start eating dogs. My point is, don't just plop in any old random footage as your b-roll. Make sure that every piece of footage that you bring into your video has a specific purpose. Okay, let's move on to tip number nine. Clean up your audio using these three key audio effects. Okay, so when it comes to cleaning up your video's audio track, everybody's experience is going to be slightly different. And that's simply because everybody's recording their audio using different equipment. So if you're fortunate enough to have some high-end equipment, then you may not need to do very much to your audio during the editing process. But if you're like me and you're recording on a budget, and are also forced to deal with a considerable amount of noise outside of your window while you're recording your videos, then what I'm about to show you may be extremely helpful to you. So when I'm cleaning up my audio, there are three key effects that I like to use. Now since I usually have so much background noise in my audio, the first effect that I like to put on my track is the denoise effect. You can find this effect in your effects panel under audio effects and noise reduction and restoration. So the way you use this is by simply selecting the audio clip that you want to work on in your timeline, then simply drag the audio effect that you want to use onto that selected clip. On a side note, just know that once you have your clip's editing window open, you can just drag any future audio effects directly into the window itself. Now before I start making any changes to the effects settings, I first like to isolate the audio clip that I'm going to be working on. To do that, I simply move my slider to the beginning of the clip, and then click on the little mark in icon in my toolbar above my timeline. Then I move my slider to the end of the audio clip, and click on the mark out icon. 
And remember, if you don't see the icons that I'm talking about in your toolbar, then just click on the little plus icon at the end of the toolbar and reset your icons using the same technique that I just showed you in tip four. Okay, so once you've got your marks in place, now turn on your loop playback. Doing this will keep your audio clip playing over and over again. When you wanna play your clip, just press the play video into out icon. So going back to the denoise effect, to edit the settings, click on the edit button located beside the custom setup heading. Okay, so inside the editor, you've got a few options. I personally only deal with two settings in here, the processing focus and the amount. When it comes to the processing focus, you have five options, and they are focus on all frequencies, focus on lower frequencies, focus on mid frequencies, focus on lower and higher frequencies, and focus on higher frequencies. So whatever frequencies you're focusing on are the ones that you're gonna be cutting out. So which of these settings that you choose really depends on the frequency of your voice. My voice tends to fall in the mid to upper low range frequencies, so I wanna leave those frequencies alone. What I'm trying to remove is the high pitch sound that the wind makes as cars rush by my window, as well as the lower rumbling sounds of the motors. So for that reason, I'm gonna select the focus on lower and higher frequencies setting. Now when it comes to the amount, the higher you raise this, the more of those frequencies that you're focusing on will be removed. So you don't wanna go crazy with this effect on your audio, or it'll begin to sound muted like this. Now if you don't, I strongly suggest you watch my videos, six things you must do before starting a YouTube channel and how to write a YouTube video script. For this reason, only remove what you absolutely need to. For my audio, I find that around 30% is the sweet spot. And your audio will obviously be different than mine. So just play around with it until you find that perfect setting that eliminates only the background noise that you're trying to get rid of. Once you're done that, just close down the window. Okay, so this next effect that I use is meant to compensate for the frequencies that were removed by the denoise effect. And that's gonna be a graphic 10 band equalizer and you can find that in your effects panel under audio effects and filter in EQ. Again, with your audio clip still selected, just drag the EQ effect into your audio clips editing window. And to edit this effect, click on the custom setup edit button one more time. Now I just wanna start off by saying that if you don't know a lot about mixing audio, then I really don't recommend that you play around with any of these settings. You can make a real mess of your audio very quickly in here. So what I do is stick to using the presets. All I want to do with this EQ effect is replace some of the frequencies that I removed with my denoise effect. So since I removed mostly higher frequencies, I'm just going to add a simple high lift preset. You can see that what this preset does is just raise all of the higher frequencies, which are the ones to the right side. Now if your denoise effect removed a lot of your lower frequencies and left you with nothing but high end audio, then you might want to use a bass lift, which raises up the lower frequencies a bit. I found that these four presets right here can pretty much correct any shortcomings caused by the denoise effect. So if we listen to it, you can hear that there's just a subtle difference to my audio when the high lift is on compared to when it's turned off. Now if you don't, I strongly suggest you watch my videos, six things you must do before starting a YouTube video channel and how to write a YouTube video script. And that's really all I'm looking for. Again, these settings are gonna vary from person to person, so you're gonna to have to play around with it until you get the sound that you're looking for. But when you're done, just close down the window. Okay, so the last effect that I'm gonna use on my audio is called the hard limiter. And you can find that effect in your effects panel under audio effects and amplitude and compression. Once again, just drag it into your audio clips editing window. So the reason that I'm using this effect is because when you're setting up the volume of your audio, what you want to try to achieve is a peak audio that goes no higher than negative six decibels and no lower than negative 12 decibels. You kind of want your levels to stay in this sweet spot right here. Anything higher than negative six decibels will start to peak into the red and that audio will become distorted. Anything lower than 12 decibels may be slightly hard to hear. Remember, the goal is to keep your audio consistent throughout the entire video. You don't want your viewers having to turn their volume up and down throughout your entire video just to listen to it at a comfortable level. So when we go inside the custom setup of the hard limiter, there are really only two settings that you need to play with in here. The first is the maximum amplitude, which you're gonna to set to negative six decibels. Now the next thing that you're gonna to wanna to change is the input boost. 
For the most part, when you're recording your videos, your audio is going to stay pretty much consistent. But there are going to be times when you accidentally turn your head away from the microphone without realizing it. So that audio clip may be 5, 6, or even 7 decibels lower than the rest of your audio clips. So let's say that the average level of your audio clips is about negative 2 decibels. This maximum amplitude setting is going to reduce all of that audio down to negative 6 decibels. But let's say that there are a few clips of your audio that are down around negative 15 decibels because you turned your head away from the microphone. In that case, the input boost will raise the level of those clips up by 6 decibels to negative 9 decibels, giving your overall audio a more consistent volume range between negative 6 and negative 9 decibels. And just know that regardless of what number you set this input boost to, that it will never raise your audio levels above the preset maximum amplitude level of negative 6 decibels. So if we listen to all of the effects together, you can clearly hear that all of the background noise has been removed, and that the audio level is staying pretty much consistent between the negative 6 and negative 12 decibel range. Now if you don't, I strongly suggest you watch my videos 6 Things You Must Do Before Starting a YouTube Channel and How to Write a YouTube Video Script. After you remove both of your marks, all you have to do now is with the clip still selected, right click on it and choose Copy. Then using your selection tool, Group select the rest of your audio, right click on one of the selected clips and choose paste attributes. All of your audio clips should now be completely cleaned up and ready to go. Now if by chance you come across a clip that still has very low audio levels, just select that clip, go into the editing window and edit the hard limiter effect by raising the input boost up by a few more decibels. This process should save you a lot of time when cleaning up your audio. Ok let's move on to tip number 10. Stick to the YouTube audio library for your background music. When it comes to using background music in your videos, I strongly suggest that you stick to using the YouTube audio library as your source for royalty free music. That library has been building up quite a bit over the last couple of years, and there's actually some really good music in there that can be used for free in your videos. Now if you can't find what you're looking for in there, then I recommend going to a paid site like Epidemic Sound. You can get an unlimited subscription for around $9 per month. But before you commit to a paid site, I strongly suggest that you take a deep dive into the YouTube audio library. If you do, I think you'll find that the free music in there will actually suffice at least until your channel is monetized and making some money so that you can splurge a little bit. That being said, stay away from any YouTube channels that claim to be offering up royalty free music free of charge. It may be royalty free now, but that doesn't mean that the artist won't change his or her mind down the road. That actually happened to me on two of my videos. I used a song that said it was royalty free at the time, but as it turns out, it either wasn't or the artist just had a change of heart later on. Now I uploaded both of these videos before my channel was monetized, so I had no reason to think otherwise. It wasn't until I got monetized that I was hit with copyright notices and found out that I wasn't able to monetize those videos. And unfortunately the music is mixed right in with the voice narration, so I can't even remove the song without taking down the video, remixing it and then re-uploading it, which would just be a total waste of time. Luckily it was only those two videos that I used the song in. It could have been a hell of a lot worse if I had used it in all of my videos. So don't risk losing your AdSense revenue for some stupid song that you can barely even hear in the background of your video. Stick to the YouTube audio library or the paid sites and keep your AdSense revenue right where it belongs, in your bank account. Ok, on to tip number 11. Pre-render all of your sequences throughout your edit. If you're ever working in Premiere Pro and you find that your playback is lagging, chances are the problem is just that all of your edited clips need to be pre-rendered. If you have a lot of clips stacked on top of one another, this is bound to happen from time to time. And you'll know if these clips need to be pre-rendered just by looking at the thin line just above your video tracks. If this line is solid yellow, or even just sections of it are yellow, then you need to pre-render out those sequences. To do this, all you have to do is place your slider at the beginning of the yellow line and then hit the mark in icon. Now just move your slider to where the yellow line ends and hit the mark out icon. Then just go up to the sequence tab in the top menu and click on it. And then from the drop down menu, choose render in to out. Then just let Premiere pre-render those clips. Once it's finished, it will automatically start playing back that sequence you just rendered. Now just hit your stop button and then hit both the clear in and clear out icons to remove the marks. 
Your lines should now be solid green. And because those clips are now pre-rendered, your video should play back as normal without any hesitations. So when you're working on longer videos, you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on that yellow line and that you're constantly pre-rendering those sections that aren't green so that Premiere isn't getting hung up while you're editing. Okay, on to my final tip. Use these two key settings to export your finished video. Okay, so once your video has been completely edited and you're ready to render it out, here's what you're going to need to do. First, look at the name of your project on the tab above your timeline. Now, go over to your project files and find the file with that same name. Now, there are going to be two files in there that have the same name. One is going to be the raw video camera footage that you dragged onto your timeline when you were first getting started. The other file is going to be your project file. It's fairly simple to tell them apart. One will have a media format attached to it like .mov or .mp4. That one's your raw media file. The other file won't have a media format attached to it. That one's your project file. They'll also have different icons in front of them as well. So what you want to do is select your project file and then go up to the file tab in the top menu and click on it. From the drop down menu, choose export, then media. This will take you to a new screen. This would be a good time to rename your rendered video file to whatever you want it to be called when you upload it to YouTube. This is also where you can pick the location to store your rendered video. It's best just to save it in your project folder right next to your three folders. Okay, so the first setting you're going to want to pick is the preset. You have a few options to choose from in Premiere, but I highly recommend that since this is a YouTube video, that you just choose the YouTube 1080p Full HD setting. Next, you want to make sure that your format is set to H.264. Those two settings should be everything you need to get a good quality render. Now all you have to do is hit the export button. And within a matter of minutes, your finished video will be ready to upload to YouTube. Okay, so hopefully these 12 tips will help to make the process of editing your YouTube videos in Premiere Pro just a little bit easier. Look, the first time you open Premiere Pro, it's all going to seem a little overwhelming. But once you've spent some time in it, it'll all become second nature to you. Now, if you'd like to watch more of my full-length tutorials on all things YouTube, then be sure and check out my playlist, Getting Started on YouTube. It has everything you need to get your YouTube business up and running. And you can find the link to that playlist right here. Until next time, take care.